Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the BDSM workshop number one. This is CGL 101 and Frequently Asked Questions. I am so excited to be in this space with all of you. I wanted to create this workshop because six years ago for me and five years ago for Tally, we entered the lifestyle. At that time, I knew that I was a little deep down. I had gotten a taste of what being a little was, but I wanted more. I wanted to understand the lifestyle. I wanted to understand what little me was all about. And there weren't books out there. There weren't workshops happening. I didn't have a little munch group in my local community. So I created my blog in an effort to chronicle my journey and help anybody along the way that was interested. I couldn't have imagined that years later I would be here talking to you in this space, giving you this workshop, answering frequently asked questions, and sharing this moment together. But here we are and I couldn't be more happy. Today in this workshop we're going to cover a few major things to break down the very basics of what CGL is all about. We're going to first address what is CGL? What does it mean? What is it all about? What is the difference between a caregiver and a dominant? Are they the same? Are they different? We're going to dive into the different types of littles because there are many labels that you can choose from to identify yourself and to find out what resonates with you. And we're going to move into the frequently asked questions that people ask about our lifestyle when they see us out and about. So we're going to answer all of those today. And as always, we say in every workshop, if you have any questions that you think of after this workshop, please send us a DM and we'd be happy to sit down with you. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to Tally. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Penny said, we're going to get started by uh, defining what is CGO. So within the BDSM umbrella, uh, BDSM stands for Bondage Discipline, Domination Submission, and Sadism Masochism. There is a branch called Domination and Submission. Domination is the individual, also called a dom or a, a female dom, who leads, guides, protects, etc. They're submissive. The abbreviated form of domination and submissive relationships is DS, using a larger letter D to indicate that the dom is the leader in the power exchange. With that said, there is a common misconception that submissives are lesser than or subservient or are, are unequal to their dominant. Now this is completely false. Any DS relationship consists of two legal adults that are 18 plus years old who voluntarily enter into a consensual relationship that may or may not be sexual in nature. So this binding relationship is deeply loving, trusting, and can be all encompassing as the submissive surrenders partial power and the responsibility to the dominant over their life. So the very nature of a DS relationship is that the true power actually lies with the submissive because they voluntarily surrender that to the dominant. And at any point, once uh, consent is pulled away, the submissive can withdraw that, that um, submission. So. Under the DS branch, there are approximately 11 major types of DS relationships. We're going to go ahead and cover uh, the 11 paths of submission at another workshop. But for today, we're just going to focus on CGL. So CGL stands for Caregiver Little. A little is a legal adult who regresses in their mind and outward behavior to a younger age that often imitates early childhood. 
Now, moving into part B, uh, what are the main types of littles in the CGL community? Now, I have to note here that this is not an all-encompassing list, but these are just the main groups. And what I'm going to do right now is to go uh, into each and every one of them because even though it uh, a certain type of little doesn't quite resonate with you, it's very important to learn about them because knowledge is power. So the first one that I wanted to talk about is what we call an adult baby or uh, an AB. An adult baby is a little with the youngest age regression. You know, this may or may not include diapers, pacifiers, sippy bottles and cups, cribs and tons of stuffies. And so the age group um, that falls under the AB uh, is some of the youngest, as I had mentioned. So this is between, you know, 0, 1, and 2, or 3. Uh, this brings back the little to that time when they were just a baby, hence adult baby. Now, the second uh, type of little is called a baby girl. Now, a baby girl or a baby boy doesn't necessarily identify with a certain age. Uh, they're more characterized by how they are emotionally sensitive and childlike in life. They also tend to be submissive. Now, the third type is what we call a brat. Brats can be either submissive or non-submissive. Some like to disobey, you know, to be tamed or to just enjoy mild to extreme punishment. So they get off on that one, on, on trying to brat their dominant, trying to misbehave uh, so that they can get that visceral reaction from their dominant. So some of them, they don't wish to submit or be punished they just want to get their way so, so and lastly a brat can be in any age range the next type is what we call a the the generic term little so what is a little a little is just a broad term for a wide age range a term for someone who maybe they're newer to the scene so they're they're not quite sure what their little age is quite yet or depending on how they're feeling depending on uh, how they feel that day they might have a fluctuating age range so they use a uh, bro broader generic term that uh, they are a little the next one is what we call a middle a middle is a general term of an older little a middle is an adult who regresses to an older child or a young teenage. It could be during the adolescent years. Uh, they may also weave in bratting and being mischievous uh, in their behavior, which many dominants find endearing and arousing. So this is characterized by ages around 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere around that age where it's, it's the very formative years where they're just not quite teenagers yet. And, um, and, and, and a lot of dominants find that endearing. The next type that I want to talk about is a nymphet. A nymphet is a middle who is generally bratty promiscuous and sexually forward so this is um, a middle that is more focused on the sexual nature uh, of their little space the next one is what we call pets this is a very broad term that includes kittens bunnies wolves puppies foxes and many many more much like a kitten they can be any age range and enjoy being played with pet and taken care of you know you think colors cute ears tags toys and tails so they're, they're very into the mindset of a pet and and they usually identify with a certain animal the next type is what we call a kitten a kitten is a subset of uh, a pet little 
which has identified with the, the animal the, uh, that is a kitten. So they enjoy being pet, petted, they enjoy being played with and taken care of like a cat. A kitten can be any age as well. You know, uh, usually they like wearing kitten ears, uh, collars, tags, toys, and, and tails. Uh, they especially like uh, collars with bells. You can, you can be a middle and a kitten. You can be really any age um, in your regression and be a part of this uh, type as well. The next type is what we call an imp. An imp is similar to a pet. Many of them enjoy being, you know, like a pet. They like being colored, played, and taken care of. Uh, what really separates them uh, from other pets like kittens is an imp is very mis mischievous. You know, it's 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 sort of like um, uh, a pet version of a brat. The next one I wanted to talk about is a, is what we call a switch. A switch is someone who identifies as both a little and a caregiver and it, it varies uh, with every individual uh, how often they go into either caregiver mode or little mode uh, it really depends on how they're feeling at that time or if, if they have a partner um, they oftentimes talk to each other and agree upon whether who's going to be the caregiver and who's going to be the little at that time so most of the time but not always uh, switches really thrive in this fluid flow between uh, themselves and their partner and and that's why they gravitate towards other switches because it's going to be very fulfilling for them the next type is what we call a dominant little a dominant little this is very important to note is still a little the very distinction uh, about being a dominant little is because of their personality they like calling the shots in a DDLG or uh, an, an MDLB relationship you know they still like to be taken care of and need the same amount of nurturing and love as any other little it's just that they're more vocal they're more upfront about what they need and they 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 communicate that with their dominant and in the relationship they like holding on to that power and control the next type is uh, a, a broad term called a submissive and this can encompass and embody any little at any age uh, submissives are characterized by their mindset of how they surrender their power to their caregiver and make sure that um, they honor their caregiver that way and giving them the gift of their submission to them the next type is what we call a baby fur or a little fur a baby fur is a person who identifies as a furry uh, what is furry? Uh, a furry is someone having an anthrop anthropomorphic animal human character representation of themselves. So they find a certain animal that really resonates with them. It's sort of like their spirit animal. And so within the furry fandom community, uh, as well as they, they can also be an adult baby, they can be a little, middle, teen. So. Uh, the, the thing that characterizes baby fur and little furs, uh, usually it's not a sexual thing for them. As opposed to seeing it as a kink, it's more of a, really more of a lifestyle for them. And the last type I, I want to go over is what we call a Lolita. A Lolita is a middle who is more interested in adult-like activities, things like tea parties, ballet, prim and proper attire, uh, classical music and instruments, antiques, learning languages, cake decorating, gardening, crafts, trying flowers, scrapbooking, and more. So for a Lolita, it's more about uh, how they dress up, how you look, uh, the, these things that you do uh, that make you look prim and proper, you know, almost like Victorian era style. And, and, and they love doing poses, 
Um, they, they love makeup and making sure that they always look put together. Um, you might have seen a lot of them, you know, in social media. Uh, they, they throw up uh, hand piece signs and take pictures uh, to look cute in kawaii. Now, moving on to part C, I wanted to talk about uh, a very important question that uh, you might have encountered during your journey in CGL. So the question is, is CGL a kink? So in order to answer this question, uh, first we must define what a kink is. So the definition of a kink, uh, a kink is a sexual taste or preference. So within the CGL community, there's a huge division among uh, the members regarding this very question. The truth is, and here's the truth, the truth is there are people in every side of the spectrum. So on one side, you have people who say CGL is a kink. And then the other side is very adamant, no, it's not a kink, it's more of a lifestyle. Um, what most people don't realize, there's a lot of people who are just somewhere in between. Somewhere in between, you know, there, there are aspects of their little space that is a kink. Some are as some, um, some of them have aspects of little space that is not a kick, that is not sexual, and that's okay. Wherever you fall in the spectrum, it's perfectly fine. So, how do you define yourself in this spectrum? So, if you gain sexual fulfillment or arousal through being a dominant, attracted to a little or a little in little space, then most likely, yes, CGL is a kink for you. But if you're at the other end of the spectrum and you do not gain sexual arousal from being little or do not have a desire to incorporate sex into your little space, you're just not into age play, perhaps, then no, being little is not a kink for you. And that is perfectly fine, too. Perhaps um, little space is more of a non-sexual escape for you. And that's perfectly fine because there are plenty of littles who are non-sexual and there's also plenty of littles that are sexual it's just a different cup of tea for everyone and um, really the truth of the matter is however uh, whichever shoe fits you better that's okay so the, the last part of this is I want to talk about uh, those littles that are not part of the BDSM community uh, they actually created a community outside of the lifestyle uh, and it is called age re or age regression these uh, age re members are non-sexual littles who do not want a dominant they do not want to be associated with BDSM in any way so they're completely non-sexual it's, it's really a lifestyle for them and so the a tree group want nothing to do with the BDSM group and that's perfectly fine you know you have a choice on how uh, your little space looks like and that's okay so for this next part uh, we are gonna go over some frequently asked questions about the CGL lifestyle so and and I have Penny here right here right here with me and she's gonna go over some questions that are usually asked in this lifestyle and I'm gonna try and answer them for everyone all right here we go question number one is DDLG or CGL in general is that legal the answer is yes DDLG is legal but let me put a very big caveat here when the relationship involves two legal adults just like any relationship that is sexual in nature you have to be a legal adult in order to enter it now do note that the legal age of consent does vary between different u.s states so be sure to check a reference to know what the laws are where you live now now that the legal part is out of the way it's important to say that just because someone is of legal age to enter into a CGL relationship doesn't mean that you should. Being in a relationship 
that is CGL or DS in nature is a serious undertaking that involves a power dynamic. It takes maturity, it takes trust, loyalty, understanding, patience, and a boatload of communication to make it work. So please use this discretion when entering into a DS bond because truthfully, a DS relationship is very powerful. It involves making yourself very vulnerable to another person. So my, my best advice is if you feel that you're not ready, if you feel like you need to learn more about what you're trying to do, then don't rush it. Take your time. Okay, I, I get that. But question number two, how long should a dom and a sub wait before having their first play session? That's a great question. And obviously, I'm going uh, I'm going to say that the answer will vary from person to person. But as a general rule, I will try to answer from my own experiences. So, Penny got into the lifestyle for over a year before slowly getting me into the lifestyle too. When we came together as DS, we didn't immediately jump into a play session. We studied we learned we reached out to people in the lifestyle who knew way more than us only when we felt confident in our knowledge did we begin to practice and explore things for ourselves and this was months down the road the key really is you want to know your partner intimately understanding their emotions background history their likes dislikes kinks and fetishes, desires, turn-offs, well before you touch each other. Now you also want to adhere to the four basic steps of a healthy play session, uh, which include communication and consent, and that's step one. Step two is play. Step three is aftercare. And step four is debriefing and feedback cannot stress this enough because you want to reach a level where you're both comfortable telling each other anything and everything before you engage in play. So in the real world, the best uh, analogy I can think of is as soon as you hit an age that you can drive, doesn't mean you have to go start driving on your own right away. You start as a student driver you learn from someone who knows this and has been doing it for years you research you you look at videos um, and then in a safe environment with someone who's experienced you start to practice and you keep practicing and you keep learning and once you're ready then it's time all right wait a minute tally hold on question three do you support minors in kink because there's many minors who are out there trying to live this lifestyle and the answer to that is no we do not we believe that the law is there for a reason and we are always one to follow the letter of the law furthermore we believe that adolescence is a time of self-discovery you're supposed to be experimenting with your image, your desires, and thinking about potential career paths while you're a teen. By nature, your behavior is slightly more risk-taking and you feel adventurous. As a teenager, we feel invulnerable. And we can do anything, we can eat anything, we can pretty much sleep with anything, and, and, and we feel fine. You know, the problem with that is that DS takes a lot from you. It takes a lot of time to be able to patiently learn about your partner. It takes time to be careful with what you do um, to yourself because this is your formative years so that all the things that you experience and if you experience trauma during this age, it's really going to stick with you for a long time. So as such, adolescence isn't the time to enter into a DS relationship and settle down. And we certainly don't think teenagers should be having sex before they are emotionally mature enough to handle such a life-changing decision. So in short, no, we do not support minors 
or people below 18 years old in kink. Okay, Tally, I have seen a lot of social media, a lot of posts where people have said a lot of mean-spirited labels that would denote that daddies and mommies are pedophiles. Is there some type of anti-CGL movement? Sadly, yes, there is. It's rooted in people who are close-minded to the truth of what our community is really about. This is why Penny and I have co-written books um, and, and resources and, and all of this information that we've tried to gather together so that we can try and enlighten people, try to share the knowledge we've learned. That the truth is CGL has never been nor will ever be about actual children. CGL involves two legal adults, one of whom assumes the role of submissive and who regresses in age to imitate a child for sexual or non-sexual reasons. So it's, it's actually an illusion. It's not the reality. The reality is these are two adults. The dominant is not actually attracted to actual children. The daddy or mommy dom simply thrives and gains pleasure from caring for their adult little. Okay, now you had mentioned earlier that there are 11 sub paths, and I know you and I will do another workshop together where we go in depth, but just to satisfy that curiosity, could you please tell what the different types of submissives are, the major sub paths of submission? Okay, just to go down the list real quick. Here are the major subpaths of submission, and like you said, uh, we're gonna go over all of these at a later uh, workshop. But here are the major subpaths. So number one, they're called general submissives. Number two, there's voluntary slavery. Number three, there are pleasure slaves. Number four, Kajira. Number five are pony girls and pony boys. Number six are pets. Number seven are furries. Number eight, taken in hand submissives. Number nine is what we call a domestic servant. Number 10 are littles, middles, and adult babies. And number 11 are masochists or pain pigs. All right, thank you. Moving on to the next question, there's a lot of times where people want to go to dungeons. They want to go to play parties and experience a scene with another person. And these dungeons, I'm wondering, you know, what if they have a bar? Should drugs and alcohol ever be allowed in that type of play space? Should that ever be involved in any type of play session or scene? The answer is no. Please do not mix drugs and alcohol into a play session. You know, admittedly, Penny and I are very straight-laced. We don't do drugs, smoke, or even drink alcohol. However, that said, the reason why we don't think the two should mix is because of the lack of impairment. You know, a, a, a play session is all about control. As someone who's running the play session, whether that's the dominant uh, or someone else, they must always be in control at all times and be of sound mind and judgment. You can't take care of your submissive or your play partner if you're impaired. Also, 100% sober consent must be granted from both parties prior to engaging in play. One of the cornerstones of BDSM is consent. So, and, and that requires you to be of sound mind in order to be able to give that to your partner. You should never take advantage of a submissive who has impaired judgment by trying to get their consent while under the influence of drugs or alcohol. That is what we call rape. 
Question number seven. I am so proud to be sitting here as your submissive. I know you and I have co-written books and we've had the blog for years and we've built servers and we're now building this with this community of friends that's incredible people and I am honored to be a part of it every step of the way. Having a DS relationship that has lasted for years now and being in your service for years is something that I cherish, is one of the most impo important parts of who I am and the most important parts of my life. A lot of times people have asked me this question and I'm gonna ask you this now. How do you think we make our DS relationship last? Now, with this topic, Penny and I could probably talk for hours and make a full workshop uh, on how to make a DS relationship last. And likely we will. But if I could just summarize it in a couple of uh, ideas and things that to be mindful of I'd say he here are some of the tips that I could give number one have a strong sense of self before you come together as a couple basically work on yourself before joining a DS relationship number two is have a clear vision of what you want from a DS relationship if you're open and honest with your partner about your expectations, everyone will be on board and you will be happier. Number three, understanding the laws of attraction and attracting the kind of partner that you want. Attraction is very important in DS. And I'm finding someone that you're really compatible with attraction-wise will go a long way. Number four, navigating through conflict and disagreements. We're only human. Everyone disagrees. You know, at, at some point you will have conflict with your partner. But if you put safeguards in place on, on how to communicate with each other, and Penny and I will, will go into further detail regarding that, it goes a long way to be able to preserve and, and make your relationship last. And finally, speaking of openness and transparency, discuss your needs and wants, both sexually and not with your partner. Make it very clear what you're looking for and what your expectations are. And the chances of um, disappointment goes way, way down. And it'll be more fulfilling for both of you. Now, I know that as we've gotten to know people in the lifestyle and made many friends along the way, our beautiful solo friends, both dominant and submissive, have asked us, where can I find a mommy or daddy? How do you make that happen? Do you do it online? Do you go locally? How do you find someone? Because I want a mommy or daddy right now. So what is the answer? Well, truthfully, I know this might sound corny, but from our experiences, the best blessings in life come when we aren't actively looking for them. Can you look for a mommy or daddy dump? Of course. Will you be successful? You might. And there are some great forums and websites available to get you started by connecting to the larger CGL community. However, we would recommend that you proceed with caution don't jump into a ds relationship too quick before you really know someone take your time ask plenty of questions remember it's okay to be picky with whom you choose as a partner remember you as a person you deserve only the best and someone who is willing to respect your boundaries uh, fulfill your expectations of them so take your time and and truthfully uh, the best thing you can do is keep working on yourself whether you want to be a submissive or a dominant, uh, keep your education going, keep working on yourself, uh, make yourself the best type of dominant or submissive that you can be so that when you do put yourself out there and, and start to meet others, they will see you and, and, and they will see what you can offer in a relationship. Great answer. All right, last question for you, my love. Why do some littles get mad at other littles online? Sometimes 
in those forums, in those chat rooms, littles can be pretty judgmental and vicious towards each other. Why is there such a gap in the community? I remember myself being on Instagram and I accidentally made the wrong hashtag and someone lashed out at me in the comments and I felt so silly and embarrassed. Why do littles get mad at each other like that? So I'm going to assume that this question is in reference to two great divides, really. Uh, the first one is the kinky littles versus the age regressors. And then the second one is the NSFW littles versus the SFW littles. So let's try and break it down uh, simply here. So there are two main groups of littles, those who identify uh, to the CGL community and those who do not. The truth of the matter is, no, no matter which side of the divide you are, we, uh, the basic concept of CGL and age re is that we all regress in age. However, there are a bunch of littles, Penny included, who also want to enter CGL relationships. And there are those who regress and do not want to have a DS relationship. There is no right or wrong way. The issue is that very young littles, you know, uh, around ages 18 to 21, or um, there, there are even some that are underage that go into a tree. They are SFW or a tree littles. Just by the nature of, of um, their regression, they can get highly irritated if they see something that is NSFW or mislabeled as a cross hashtag. Penny has gotten scolded a few times when she accidentally put age aggression like she was talking about. I mean, ultimately, you're getting angry over the content of an image. They get angry that the author of the post happens to be CGL instead of SFW, and quite frankly, that's a little, a little ridiculous. You know, I understand not wanting to see NSFW content but there's really absolutely no reason to be rude. There's absolutely no reason to tear each other apart. Because ultimately at the core of both groups, it's about age regression. It's about how it makes you feel. So whether you like um, pistachio or you like pecan praline, whatever flavor of ice cream or little space you like, each one is valid. Great answer. All right, I'm going to finish off with the conclusion here as we wrap up our workshop. I want to thank everybody for listening, for tuning in. If questions bubbled up in your mind, I encourage you to reach out via DMs. This journey for you as a little is your own. Just as my journey has been, just as everybody's journey is unique, make it your own. Be yourself. Stay true to who you are. Know that you are just as valid a little as anybody else. That there are a million of us out there who are cheering you on. And I'm with you and Tally is with you every step of the way. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>